Half a million Americans are dead. Many of us haven't seen family and friends in a year. How do we deal with the destruction and fear and depression and anxiety that COVID has inflicted on our psyches and particularly on our kids? Professor Dr. Justin Frank, psychiatrist, is with us next. Check it out, leave your comments, ding the bell, share it with your friends and subscribe to our channel. We had a caller a couple days ago, uh, I think it was Monday, um, uh, expressing concern for his son um, uh, that you know he was going through a tough time as a result of the COVID and being home and 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 who who knows I mean when you're talking about kids uh, with the social in this a day and age of social media if he was being bullied things like that and he was concerned that his son might even be suicidal and was asking what do I do with this and and I I said you know I'm not qualified to answer that question. Um, Dr. Justin A. Frank, MD, however, is. He's a psychoanalyst and a clinical professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at George Washington University, the author of Trump on the Couch, including Obama on the Couch and Bush on the Couch, his former books. Uh, his Twitter handle, which is the best way to reach him and say hi, is Justin Frank, MD, which is spelled just the way it sounds. And uh, Dr. Frank, welcome back. How, how best, in your opinion, uh, what, what should parents be looking for and, and, and how best to deal with children who seem to be in distress, particularly this kind of uh, the, the, the suicidal variety or the, the depressive variety of distress as a consequence of the circumstances of the day? Well, most, most parents, hi Tom, most parents know uh, that the best way uh, to talk to children is to try to listen to them first and see where they're at and what's bothering them and what they're thinking about. Uh, then one wants to move further ahead and think about whether they have actual uh, thoughts about hurting themselves, how they feel, what they like about themselves, what they think about the future, what they think about COVID. Uh, are they looking forward to getting back to school? I mean, see if they're really interested in life and in uh, the vital parts of life and also a sense of their uh, creative self, their self-esteem, uh, as opposed to uh, the problem of having a negative self or having a part of you that doesn't like you. And I think both parts exist in all of us to some extent, and certainly in kids. It's important to be able to pay attention uh, to those things clearly and try to uh, listen to them and see if they've had any thoughts or fantasies or feelings about it. I mean, it goes further than that if you want to see a professional but uh, go ahead with what your thoughts are well how do you open that conversation i mean i having having raised three kids myself i'm real familiar with the how are you feeling fine right where, where did you go out what did you do nothing uh that's yeah true. exactly uh so the way to open it is uh to say what you've been noticing without necessarily asking a direct question you know i notice you've been keeping to your room a lot uh, lately. Uh, you, could we talk about it or what's going on? Or, you know, uh, it's like being open to be listening rather than saying, how are you or how are you feeling? Because those are direct questions that can be completely denied or ignored or dismissed by most kids or many kids, like you said. I've also raised three children, and, um, and they get depressed sometimes, and I've dealt with their... Mm -hmm. Uh, sadness and their depression by trying to listen to them and uh, when they bring it up or when it comes out. I, I, it's hard to open the conversation, but a lot of times, I mean, I was just referred a family uh, recently where the oldest son committed suicide and uh, to help them deal with the aftermath of that. And and uh, it's terrible because they knew something was wrong and they didn't know how to approach him. And he kept denying that he was suicidal. And, uh, and this is a very loving, concerned family. And uh, it's horrible. Uh, yeah. And I think the best way to do it is to try to psychologically uh, approach the child with a very loving parental love and not just saying, what did you do? What are you thinking? But like, you know, what's going on? Or you feel like, or sitting next to them. I sometimes, when they're younger, I actually go and hang out with them in their room, and uh, if they invite, mm -hmm. they let me in. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's yeah. important yeah. to just be able to listen to what's bothering them, 
And there are lots now, of things, mainly with school and friends and isolation. Yeah, there there are two things that you said that, that mm. triggered questions in my mind. Um, the first was about depression and sadness. Um, is it is it not important to tell kids that sometimes being depressed and sometimes being sad is an entirely appropriate response to circumstances out of your control that you don't like, and we just have to figure out ways to work through that? Yes. In fact, I think that's very important. It's also important to tell the parents that so they don't panic about having a sad child. And because of the interview that happened the other day with Megan uh, on the Oprah show, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. brought up the issue of suicide a lot. And I think that it's very scary to parents if they have a sad child. No, sadness is part of life. And, uh, and it's not the same thing as suicide. And sadness is a, is a feeling that you, one can get over, just like one is not happy all the time, one's not going to be sad all the time. I think it's very good what you said. It is, yeah. it is a, it, it's not depression. Sadness and depression are not the same thing. And then the second point that you raised was, you know, the sense of a future. I remember uh, a couple of decades ago when I was very into studying and writing about, um, you know, kind of psychology in general, all those books I wrote on ADD. And, and I read a study that found that among people who were suicidal, genuinely suicidal, and particularly among people who ultimately committed suicide, one of the most common characteristics was that they could not um, imagine their own future. They couldn't look into the future and see themselves a year or two years, three years from now in a way that had enough detail that indicated that they were actually visualizing it. Um, can you speak to that? Is that is, I, and, and how do you deal with that? Well, one of the things you raised as you, and you asked that when you were doing your research, it was on ADD. And people who have attention deficit disorder have a much harder time imagining the future than people who don't. So people who do are uh, have that problem, really it's much harder for them to conceptualize what they're going to look like, what they're going to feel, where they're going to be in a year or two, and how they're going to do. They don't have that kind of imagination for some reason. It's just it's the way they're wired, really. It's not, uh, it's just the way it is. Whereas other people who are more obsessional or more, you know, in schoolwork, they get an assignment, they do the homework right away, they take care of things right away, they have a sense of the future, they have a sense of their grade and what the teacher's going to say, they have a sense of all these things, whereas a person with ADD usually procrastinates to the last minute and doesn't really have a clear sense of even time or how long something will take. But a sense of the future is very important, and one of the things that's clear about what Meghan Markle said, I think that tapped into a lot of concerns that parents have, is that there was a sense of hopelessness, that there was no yeah. future for her, that she was completely lost. She was an outcast in this huge new uh, social network that she had married into, and that she had nobody to go to or to talk to, and she didn't know what to do. And there's a sense of hopelessness that is one of the building blocks, the sad, tragic building blocks uh, to the suicidal person, where they really feel hopeless about the future. They feel trapped. They feel no way out. And the suicide is basically a wish to relieve themselves of just awful pain, whether it's emotional. Yeah. I mean, it's e easier to talk about physical pain and suicide to big of chronic. So can we help? We're, we just have 15 feel. seconds. Can we help people construct a future for themselves? Yes, you can help them construct the future by both allying yourself with them and say that in a way, when I was your age, I didn't have a sense, a sense of the future, and these are some of the things I thought about, and let's uh, try to read a book or talk about something in the future uh, and share right. some thoughts and feelings.